and welcome. I'm Eloni Bhatt and you're watching ET India Rising. It's a series where we speak with India's top corporate leaders and policy experts on the roadmap for India as a 100-year-old democracy in 2047. Our experts examine the priorities, the potential and the policies that are in place to ensure that the growth that India wants is sustainable and inclusive. And today, I'm very happy to have with me Sulaja Firodia Motwani. She is the founder and CEO of Kinetic Green Energy and Power Solutions. Sulaja, what a pleasure to have you here with us today. Very happy to be here chatting with you. Sulaja, let's begin with EVs. India wants to transition to net zero by 2070. Uh, and essentially, this means that sustainable mobility is the only way forward. And within sustainable mobility, EVs will play a big role. But currently, the adoption of EVs in India is a little low, especially because they're expensive. And the other infrastructure, you know, the charging infrastructure, or maybe the servicing infrastructure is not really in place. The other problem with EVs is that they are being powered currently by fossil fuels. So in the backdrop of all of this, you know, how do you see the adoption of EV? So first of all, there is no doubt in my mind that the future is green. And therefore, the future of transport is also green. Um, today, vehicular emissions, you know, contribute almost 25% to the pollution in our country. And India has some of the world's most polluted cities in the top 30 cities, 22 are from India. So as a country, as we move towards net zero, addressing the issue of pollution and therefore green transport is central to achieving our goals. I think that the government of India and the industry together have done a fantastic job of setting the roadmap for such a green transport. Um, in the last five to six years, we have made a lot of progress. Um, unlike the West, uh, the government of India has focused on promoting electric mobility in the areas which are important to India. So not aping, you know, the US or the Western worlds where the focus is on cars. Here the government and us are focused on promoting electric two-wheelers, three-wheelers and buses. And why that is important is because 85% of India moves on these products. It's only 15% of India which is using cars as their mode of transport. Uh, the middle class India uses buses uh, for their uh, public transport or three-wheelers. And almost all of India is using two-wheelers, you know, to go to office and colleges. India is the world's largest three-wheeler market, world's second largest two-wheeler market. And more importantly, these are all light mobility products and intra-city products. That means they move within a city. Therefore, you don't need a very large charging infrastructure on highways to promote electric vehicles. You can give enough energy on board, enough range on board, so that person can use the vehicle for his or her day's requirements. So with all these factors coming together and the support of the government through schemes like FAME, uh, lower GST, uh, we have already made a good beginning to promote electric vehicles in our cities. Uh, India has reached a 5% penetration of electric vehicles. With now new schemes like PLI uh, for vehicle manufacturing, for cell manufacturing, I have no doubt in my mind that EVs will become more and more cost effective. And more and more people, as they adopt EVs, other people you know, will also experience them. In India, it's a word of mouth driven market. Jo dikta hai, wo bikta hai. So I think all of this will lead to a momentum where certainly uh, two-wheelers and three-wheelers and buses will have a large percentage of electric vehicles, you know, as, as we come closer to, let's say, 2030, maybe more than 50%, and therefore not less than 70%, you know, in the next 15 to 20 years. India is looking at a battery swapping policy, and I believe in the last meeting that the government had with stakeholders, it's essentially going to focus on the safety of uh, uh, batteries and the performance of batteries. But, uh, you know, what does it mean then if batteries are not standardized, for instance, and how do you see that impacting interoperability? First of all, I think battery swapping is a very big opportunity, uh, especially for small vehicles like two, three, two and three wheelers to make electric vehicles very affordable to the customers. See, as we move to a new technology, it's important that the customers find the convenience of using new, this new technology similar to what they were using earlier or better. So today you buy a vehicle, you can go to any gas station to take fuel, right? And uh, that makes it convenient for people to use their vehicles wherever they want in the city. Um, secondly, today there is subsidy on electric vehicles given by the government of India, which allow the cost of the electric vehicle batteries to be subsidized partly but subsidies cannot continue forever. So as subsidies go away, and as more and more people want to buy electric vehicles, we have to make it convenient for them to be able to use them. I think their battery swapping plays an important role. 
especially for small vehicles because the batteries are small so they can be easily picked up and put into a swapping station. Um, I personally believe that uh, interoperability as a solution uh, should emerge. Safety and performance of course is basic. But if there is interoperability, either championed by the government or by, or by the players themselves, then we can give customers more convenience to swap their batteries anywhere in the city. Otherwise, they are forced to use a small loop of battery stations if they only work with one particular operator. They, have, they would have concern whether the operator will continue or not, whether the cost will be affordable or not. So I think some form of interoperability or at least part standardization uh, will emerge. Uh, just as requirement of the market, uh, voice of customer, uh, forcing people to come together. So I believe that consortiums will be formed or you may have a one very large player who commits uh, you know, to setting up a very wide battery swapping network through scale and they therefore become the dominant player, one or two such players. That also could emerge. You know, when do you see this uh, ecosystem gaining this sort of scale, you know, some sort of time frame that we I think anything of this nature would take time, so maybe another two to three years at minimum. Um, so we are hoping that the fame scheme would continue for another three years so that customers continue to find EVs affordable. And in these three years, uh, there would be uh, ecosystem would evolve, uh, sales would be made locally, bringing down the cost of batteries. So I think we are in that stage where people are beginning to think about electric vehicles. They're talking about it when they speak, you know, meet their friends over dinner and drinks. In India, they speak only about three things, films, mm -hmm. cricket, and automobiles. So now when they speak about automobiles to their friends, they are talking about EVs. They are coming to our showrooms to check out the products. So we have to ensure that this momentum continues and we give customers the right cost, the right product, the right convenience. There was a big thrust on green growth in the budget. What would you have liked to see in the budget? So this year, the big announcement was that the capital equipment being imported for cell making would not attract custom duty. And that again is a consistent move by the government trying to promote Make in India at the heart of its electric mobility you know, um, vision. And I think it's very welcome. But I think what we would have really liked to see, and we are still hopeful to see because we still have a year before fame scheme is, um, comes to an end, that the incentives to customers should continue uh, either fully or maybe there is a you know, graded uh, decline and not a 100 and zero uh, sudden stoppage of incentives because that would definitely disrupt the momentum but suddenly EVs will become very expensive. Mm -hmm. So again, people will, you know, hesitate. hesitate to buy. So I think this momentum should continue and we would like to see that the government continues to support this EV adoption. So Lita, you know, I now want to focus on the macroeconomic uh, situation. Global growth is expected to slow down in the backdrop of the continuing war between Ukraine and Russia, uh, high interest rates and also high inflation across the world and the lingering effects of uh, COVID. What are the two or three things that you think India needs to do to remain resilient, though many have said that India remains a bright spot in uh, the global uh, scenario? Okay, so I think if you read between the big message in the budget that was recently announced, um, I think what I found most heartening is due in this whole macroeconomic gloom, if I can use the word, uh, because of war and you know low GDP rates around the world, India is actually shining as a bright star. Uh, we're talking about 7%, 6.5% GDP growth rates, which is the highest in the world. And what is in fact more heartening is that the India story is being driven by the local consumption opportunities. So for the first time, you know, we are making great uh, use or we are leveraging the strength that we have in our numbers, in our big middle class, in our youth coming as a consuming population, as a part of the productive workforce. And that I think is India's biggest strength. And that, if it is supported by the government, as they are talking about, with huge infrastructure spending, that will create jobs, that will create you know, more uh, consumption. So I think that because of the local consumption being strong and because of the right focus on infrastructure spending, I think India will be able to retain its growth rates and to that extent remain resilient. Of course, inflation is a worry. But as long as there is an eye on inflation and there is a way to moderate it, I think moderate inflation supported by fast growth could make India as a you know, strong contender to remain a front runner in, in the growth rates. Um, I think what needs to be done, you asked me what are the, uh, the, the important levers. I think definitely infrastructure spending is an important lever. I think focus on creating local consumption is an important lever. 
I think also the China plus one opportunity should be leveraged by India in a very strong way, where actually that will spur uh, manufacturing locally, it will create more jobs, uh, it will create more export opportunities, which will further strengthen the economy. I think that the China plus one strategy for implementation so far uh, is still not as effectively implemented. You know, I think we need to still focus on it, but the opportunities are there. So I think local manufacturing, uh, leveraging MSMEs, leveraging local markets, spending on infrastructure are the right moves which the government is making and should continue to make. I think there is no stopping India. So Lija, focusing on MSMEs now, you know, they're known as uh, the powerhouse of the economy, really fueling growth and really uh, fueling uh, business opportunities. How do you see MSMEs come through as far as EVs are concerned and especially inputting into the battery infrastructure in you know, in various other parts manufacturing uh, when it comes to EVs. So I'm very bullish on the future of MSMEs in India. See, today's small companies are tomorrow's big companies. A big company only emerges when small companies succeed and, you know, have a strong uh, roadmap for growth. And I think MSMEs are a big strength of the Indian economy where we have a large percentage of our output coming from MSMEs, a large number of people engaged in MSMEs as entrepreneurs or as, you know, workforce. Um, so I think MSMEs are going to remain a part, important part of the India growth engine. Um, I feel when it comes to EVs, in fact, they have even a bigger role to play because it's a completely new opportunity. Um, so far in the last 100 years, you know, the world is powered by the ICE engine. And because it is a globally established market or technology, people who have scale are the ones who have, let's say, dominated the market. They have created global platforms. They have invested so much money that it's very difficult for a new player to come in and you know make a big difference to make a to to invest in innovation. EV is a completely different opportunity, where there is a you know wide platform for innovation available. Uh, in EVs, uh, you don't have to make your own engine. People are buying out the components, buying all the technology, whether it's a motor or a controller or a IoT solution, and that creates new opportunities for innovation new opportunities for MSMEs to come with you interesting solutions and it is no longer the scale, it is the innovation that will you know, uh, pave way for future growth. Yeah. And I think it will not only help the MSMEs, it will also help the EV sector because it's the youth which is you know, brimming with new ideas and it is the youth who is going to adopt EVs as well. So they know what the young customers want. So I think it's the first time that in the auto world of automobiles, uh, it is not just the scale, but innovation and, you know, work at the grassroots levels and new ideas that will drive the future growth. So I think MSMEs will play a big role in, in India's EV story. Uh, for the first time, we're also seeing women on the shop floor in automobiles. It's not a, related to MSME, but new opportunities. Um, a large part of the EV workforce can be women. Um, startups, startups are coming with new ideas. They're getting funding. They're becoming unicorns. So not just MSMEs, but women, startups are the new segments which can emerge uh, stronger because of the EV revolution. So when you look at uh, the offtake uh, for EVs, can you share any numbers with us in terms of women? And then you also spoke about you know, women on the shop floor uh, and all of that. You know, Are you seeing that actually happen within the EV space in India? Taking the second part first, that uh, women on the shop floor, it is actually you know something that is emerging in a very strong way. Mm -hmm. So not only at Kinetic Green, but some of the other companies in the country, EV makers, for example, Ola, for example, Piaggio, have come and made statements that for the first time they have a large percentage of their uh, operators as women. So earlier women in automobiles were mostly involved in marketing, finance, advertising, the desk jobs. But the shop floor didn't see any women mm -hmm. because maybe the, you know, the um, engines were heavy, the working conditions were different, there was uh, forging and welding. In EV, it's more focused on assembly. Um, and the components are lighter. So I think for the, and it can be easily automated as well. So I think therefore you're seeing that women are actually coming in the shop floor, not just in vehicles, but if you look at even the subsystems, EV has more electronics than mechanical parts. So in our own group company called Kinetic Communications, where we make controllers uh, and clusters for EVs, we have 100% women on the shop floor. Um, if I look at another company called Kinetic Electric, which is making the traction motors, Again, we have almost 75% women on the shop floor. So not only vehicles, but also the subsystems, which are more software and electronics driven, will have more opportunities for women to come on the shop floor. 
Um, so I really genuinely believe that because EVs are more about electronics and software and it's assembly based and not physically demanding manufacturing process, I think more and more women will come forward and I think it's high time. Yeah. Uh, coming to EV users, um, I think overall in automobiles, women are now becoming more and more important as the potential customers. Today all the college going girls have scooters. Most of the housewives who typically want to have a scooter as a second, you know, as a vehicle to move around uh, during the day. Um, also, I think in cars, uh, what is interestingly happening is that many people are adopting electric cars, but maybe as a second car in the family. Uh, because still today people feel that, you know, as a primary car where they want the whole family to go from, let's say, uh, Mumbai to Goa or, you know, uh, Delhi to Agra, we don't have charging infrastructure in place. So to buy EV as the first car, there is hesitation. But EV makes way for a very good second car. So you have your primary car and the families which can afford a second car. If you have an electric car, it can be a very good tool to use within the city, you know, and you save huge amounts of money on petrol. And that's again where women are an important segment. segment. So I think overall in automobiles um, and especially in scooters and cars, um, women are important. People are designing products with women in mind. Uh, positioning products with women in mind, I think that trend will only magnify. If you look at transit and safety, you know, India's road uh, network is expanding and also the number of vehicles we see are on the rise. And soon, a lot of these vehicles in the next coming years are going to be EVs. But how do you see the safety ecosystem evolve when, when we look at technology? For instance, when we look at AI, we look at blockchain, you know, we look at ML. How do you see that impacting this entire segment, especially in the light that nearly 45% of accidents today involve two wheelers? That's a great question and let me answer it in two ways. I think Safety on the road is very critical uh, as our loved ones are moving, you know, uh, using any kind of vehicle. I think it's very important that they are safe and, you know, we feel safe. I think it has two parts. One is regulation and then one is technology. I think in regulation, I'm sorry to say that even today in India, in many cities, helmet rule is not implemented. In my own city in Pune, you see college going children, they don't use helmets. Uh, it's enforced much better in cities like Delhi, but there is a 100% need to enforce uh, helmets for two-wheelers. We cannot have people riding two-wheelers without helmets because that's the basic safety parameter. Similarly, seat belts. Um, I think, again, the implementation of seat belt, whether it's front seat or rear seat, needs to be enforced. Uh, we've had some very unfortunate accidents, which were we could have had a much better outcome if people were wearing seat belts. So I think this is very important that these basic safety rules are implemented uh, with strong fines and uh, you know actions by the government. Um, coming to technology, I think EVs can really help to make vehicles much safer. Uh, first of all, uh, as I, we discussed, EVs is much more about electronics. And you can very easily have um, IoT solutions where using sensors, and this is coming, this is not only on paper, it's implemented in practice, you can have Predictive uh, maintenance, uh, you know, that can be built into uh, the customer and the company interaction, where through the sensors, the company can pick up through the IoT solutions uh, if the motor is uh, heating or the, you know, battery charging is not proper or if the battery is heating or the tire pressure is not correct. And this information can be fed back to the customers directly or through the dealers so that the customers can ensure that the vehicle is always kept in uh, very good condition so that accidents uh, or heating or fires can be minimized. So this ability of uh, using software and electronics, you know, to communicate, uh, communicate to um, and, uh, and doing remote diagnostics, I think is something that can very be easily be Im implemented in EVs at not much additional cost. Mm -hmm. You can do the same in ICE vehicles as well today, but the cost is higher because mm -hmm. your powertrain is mechanical. And to add a layer of IoT solutions, you have to have additional cost in EV, there's no additional cost because your powertrain is electronics. Mm -hmm. So you can just by adding a few chips or adding a few sensors can effectively do this at a much lower cost. You can do things like over there updates, which can promote safety. So I think that not only Kinetic Green, but the whole world is looking at EVs as an opportunity to provide safety and better communication for predictive maintenance. 
Kinetic, like uh, so many other players, is attempting to bring green mobility to the masses. But competition is really intensifying in especially the low speed segment and there are many players that have come in. So when we look at regulations, you know, how do you see them evolve so that, you know, safety is maintained and also manufacturing practices are standardized and as a big ecosystem player, you know, how are you driving the change in shaping green mobility? This is one sector where the government has been consulting the stakeholders and together we can definitely find the right solutions so that India not only creates a very big market but also very big manufacturing base for EVs. Um, I, think, I think India probably lost out in the previous transformatory opportunities like solar uh, or like semiconductor. I think in e-mobility we still have a chance to lead the world not only in the number of EVs sold, we can be world's number one electric vehicle market but also we can become a supplier of innovation and subsystems to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, things like powertrain, motor, controllers, converters, clusters, the software, the IoT solutions. India can be the source of technology for the whole world. So battery is something where we have kind of lagged. We are now making, taking the steps you know, to promote cell manufacturing. But as new technologies come up like hydrogen, you know, as uh, uh, capacitors or uh, uh, new forms of chemistry, uh, which are not currently prevalent in the world, China being the dominant uh, market, India could lead in the innovation as well. So I would very much like to see India leading the innovation and becoming a supplier of technology to the world, not only as a big EV market for customers, but for manufacturing as well. So Lija, you ventured into the two-wheeler segment. In 2021, we saw the rollout of two uh, e-scooters, Zing and Zoom, in 2022. Then we saw the Zing high-speed scooter being rolled out. And now we believe uh, we're soon going to see the iconic Kinetic Luna come out in the uh, electric Aftar. You know, talk to us about the potential that you see uh, for EVs in the two-wheeler segment and the outlook that you have for business and for Kinetic going forward. First, let me say that I'm so excited about the, uh, you know, the potential for e-mobility and making a difference that I can't sleep at nights. Mm -hmm. So I'm staying up at night thinking about all the possibilities and the future ahead. Uh, at Kinetic, uh, we've always, you know, been passionate about making a difference. Whether it was 60 years ago, bringing the Luna, you know, which became household name and gave mobility to the upcoming Indian middle class. Jalmeri Luna became a household uh, you know, um, slogan. Uh, kinetic Honda also ushered in a new world uh, of mobility of gearless scooters. It gave freedom to women. Uh, in my college, for example, all the women you know, students would have Kinetic Hondas. It made a big difference to lives of people. I think Kinetic Green is one such new opportunity for Kinetic to make a further difference to the lives of Indians and people around the world. Um, we are very passionate about being part of people's lives to have a kinetic park, you know, outside every home is, is really my dream. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, opportunity to make a further difference, take ahead the legacy of the family and the group. Uh, we are aiming to be front runners in electric light mobility. So we have decided that the difference we want to make is at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, provide transportation, green transportation to India's middle class. Uh, so electric two wheelers, electric three wheelers. Um, and the small format golf carts, you know, for transportation at tourism spots, heritage spots is really the area we are focusing on. I don't see us getting into electric buses or electric trucks or passenger cars. Uh, so our focus will be light mobility. Um, and that's where the large market opportunity in India also lies. And that's where Kinetic brand also is very well accepted and respected. So I think this is all sort of coming together, our dream, our passion, our focus, our strength. We began the journey in Kinetic Green through electric three-wheelers. In 2016, we launched our electric three-wheelers. We are one of the early pioneering companies. Uh, we have sold close to one lakh you know, electric three-wheelers, both in L3 and L5 format. Uh, we have our own proprietary platforms. Uh, we then joined the uh, electric two-wheeler uh, opportunity. Um, and I think that's another area where there is a great potential. Um, and uh, we look forward to bringing many new products in this electric two-wheeler space. You talked about Kinetic Luna coming back, so I'm happy to announce that the e-Luna will be coming in 2023. And uh, this product is coming out as a, a product that builds on the core values of Luna, which is affordability, convenience, um, and simplicity. Uh, but the product is completely new. It's completely electric. It's built on a new uh, powertrain as well as a mechanical platform. We will bring multiple variants of eLuna in the market. 
designed for small town mobility, designed for this new big B2B delivery world for which the product can be very comfortably used. And we will also bring an export variant as well so that kinetics electric vehicles can also go to the world. So aggressive plans, exciting plans uh, to bring electric two wheelers and three wheelers. And again, to make a difference by providing solutions uh, which make a difference to lives of people. So Laja, it's been wonderful speaking with you. Thank you so very much for your thoughts and for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you.